Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. Let's join guest minister Rob Hunt for today's message. Let's go ahead and uh, turn to 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. As you do, I want to let you know we're going to be talking about the heart, what it means to believe with the heart, what it means to uh, believe God with your whole heart. What does that mean? We hear a lot of times the phrase, uh, have you accepted Christ into your heart? Do you believe that with all your heart? Even, even other phrases like, I love you with all of my heart. And the, what, is that, what does the heart mean? Mark uh, Lowry Gave, gave a whole uh, comedy routine about this, about how the heart is, uh, you know, in the, in the Hebrew culture from the Bible, if we were to have translated it literally, it would have been the bowels. Because in their culture, that's what the seed of the emotion is, is the bowels, you know. I love God with all of my bowels. I, I accept, have you accepted Jesus into your bowels, you know? And, and how, how would that change the love songs that we've written, you know? <laughs> uh, just think of all the love songs that you talk about, about the, the heart, you know? I love you with all my heart. I left my heart in San Francisco. How would that change everything if you were to have done it with a belt? But in, in Western civilization, that's very correctly translated. It, we view the heart as the center of our emotions. In reality, does any thinking actually take place in your blood, blood pumping organ? No, it's, it's still all in between your ears. It's just talking about a deeper part of you, a root part of your emotions, the part of you that, that is brought to tears, that cry, the thing that moves you, your deep motivations, your attitudes, your, your believers. So... That's what we're going to talk about today, is what does it mean to believe with all of your heart, to trust in God with all of your heart? Well, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, let's go ahead and read that. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations, look at that word imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought, look at the word thought there, to the obedience of Christ. Now, as people, and as Christians in particular, we like to categorize everything that goes on in between our ears. Every thought that we have in our head what does it mean? Where did that come from? We have a thought and we think, oh, what was, what was it? Is that from the, the angel that's on this shoulder or from the devil that's on this shoulder? Or maybe it was just me. Maybe it was the pizza I ate last night. Is it from my, was that my intellect or was it my emotions talking? Was it my head? Was it my heart? Was it the flesh or was it the spirit? Or was it, we, we've got all these different ways of categorizing it. You know, what is it? Where did that thought come from? I'm going to make it really simple for you here, okay? He says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Between those two words there, where he says imaginations and thought, in the Greek, those two words encompass every single thing that could ever possibly go on in between your ears. Every, every imagination, every dream, every thought, every inhibition, every inkling, every motivation, every feeling, every, anything that could go on in your head. He's saying, I, I'm making it very simple for you. Whatever goes on in there, in the realm of your spirit, mind, soul, whatever you want to call it, if it is contrary to Jesus Christ, it's a stronghold that's got to be broken, bound, cast out, got, gotten rid of. Amen? If it's contrary to the gospel, if it's contrary to the knowledge that he who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also freely give us all things? 
that's contrary in any way to the unconditional love of God, wherever it came from, it's got to go. It's a stronghold, and it might be buried down there pretty deep. We're going to talk about how do you change that. See, I want to I focus on uh, what goes on inside of our thought realm and our heads. And I want to be- boil it down to just two basic categories here, okay? Like I said, we have lots of categories, and all those categories are great. And we could talk about psychology and things like the study of the mind, and, and all that is wonderful. But I just want to bury, boil it down for the, the purpose of my sermon here. I want to boil it down to just two different categories here, okay? You've got the, the, uh, the outward man, kind of the, the shallow way of thinking, day-to-day, everyday stuff. And you've got the inward man. You could call it, uh, you know, the difference between your conscious mind and your subconscious mind. You could call it the difference between your head and your heart. But I want to focus on this deeper part of you, the deeper part that some might call it the subconscious, some might call it the, the heart, the seed of the emotions, the inner man. I want to call it, for the sake of this, this sermon, I want to call it the believer, your believer, your deep down believer, the part of you that believes, the part of you that it's ingrained inside of you, what what you believe, your deepest habits, your deepest emotions, your deepest, the things that motivate you. So I want to discuss that a little bit. Go ahead and put the slide of what uh, uh, what the sermon is about. The title of my message here is The Faith Connection. It kind of looks like The Love Connection, you know, that dating show, you know, but this is, uh, this is talking about how to believe with your heart, how to hook up faith into your heart. And that's how faith works, is you hook it up into the very core, deepest part of you, your believer. Turn to Proverbs chapter 4. <clears throat> Proverbs 4 and, cha- and verse 20. This is Solomon talking, and to give you a little bit of background to this, uh, verse 20 here, he says, My son, give attention to my words. My son, this was David talking to Solomon. David, King David, talking to his son Solomon and and imparting wisdom to him. As a father, his son saying, Hey, look, I know a few things. Let me impart this wisdom to you. He says, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Don't let the whatever... Are you starting to see that he's repeating himself again and again? He's emphasizing this. You need to get this. This is important for your life. And there's places in the Bible where it emphasizes things. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say to this mountain... He's he's letting these truths out. For how, that are very important for how you should live your life. And this is one of those places here where he says, hey, I'm going to let you know, I know, I'm going to let you know something. This is, this is a secret for living your life. It's going to take you, it's going to, wow, don't miss it. For they are life to those that find them, health to their flesh. And this is where he gets to it. It's all, I mean, he spent basically the whole chapter building it up to this. Don't miss this. And he gets to verse 23 here. He says, keep your heart with all diligence. You ready for it? Keep your heart with all diligence. Your believer, the seed of your emotions, the subconscious, whatever you want to call it, the inner man, keep that with all diligence. For out of it flows the wellspring of life. And then he goes on to say some other things that, that are very related to this. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips away from you. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Watch the words that you speak. That's a good indication. I only have to listen to somebody for five minutes before I know whether they're walking in faith or not. Watch those things. Watch the words. Let your eyes, verse 25, let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right ahead of you. You see, Jesus, 
Jesus taught about not worrying about tomorrow, but about looking at what, what is right there in front of you now. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. Set yourself on a, on a path where you're going. Know where you're going. So many people, you ask them, where, where are you going in life? Where's life taking you? What goals, what, what kind of things are you putting your faith out there to believe God? What kind of mountains are you speaking to, to command to move? What are those goals that you have in your life? So many people wouldn't be able to answer you. Don't have a good answer for that. Well, I don't know. Well, I'm just going with the flow. Well, I don't really know where I'm going. You see, <clears throat> God gave you the ability in your heart to believe things, to hook up in faith with him, to believe things, to, to imagine things, to set your heart on things. Don't waste that. Chuck Colson, man of God, minister, uh, put it this way. He says, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. See, your attitude is the way that your, your deep heart views things. Jesus said, your eyes are the light of your body. How do you view things? How do you look at things? How does the deepest part of you, whatever comes your way, that's what, what the deep core of you uh, reacts to it. That's what's on the inside of you. Attitude has a great effect on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts, than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do, than appearances, than giftedness or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we could do is play on the one thing we have. That is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. Every successful person in life, especially the people who have come from not so successful backgrounds to gain that success, every one of them will tell you this. Get a hold of your insides. Get a hold of your attitude. Gain a hold on your heart, on your deepest believer, on your focus, on your core. Every successful person will tell, that, tell you that. That anything that is in your life right now, whether good or bad, is a direct result, a direct result of the things that you've been believing, the attitudes that you've been allowing yourself to to hold on to the deepest part of your heart. Only the successful ones are willing to admit it. But it's true for everybody, good or bad, what's in your life. <clears throat> you see, Liz and I have, um, I want to give a little testimony time. Liz and I, uh, we just recently started to discover, you know, just a fresh re revelation of these truths. You know, Mark eleven twenty three, 23, and, and, and uh, putting your faith in God to achieve the impossible. And we begin to look at, in our prayer lives, we have a, about every year, roughly, we get together and we have a, a time where we set, a, set out our goals, the things we're going to pray for throughout the year, and we write them down. And... Um, just recently, we had done that. And we begin to look back over the years, over the last three, four, five years, and see some of these lists that we had compiled. And we realized that, for the most part, everything that was on these lists, it was, it was crazy. It was kind of eerie how everything on these lists, go figure, 
had, co had basically come to pass. You know, the things that we had talked about from, you know, our, our kids in school and our careers and the debt, finance, uh, all these things, they were long-term goals, but we just decided we are going to pray for that, about them and stuff, and we wrote them down, and we kept them in our prayers, and, and through the years, we could point back and we could look at, whoa, what, we said that back then. Wow, look at it right here. Wow. And the thing that it, the thing that it uh, really blew our minds about all this is, is, is we came to this realization. We thought, whoa, we got to start writing some more far out there goals. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We got to start, we got to quit writing these little safe goals down, you know. Don't be, start believing God for some things that will, will keep your attention, all right? That's impossible. That's out there, all right? All right, and be, because the impossible, if it's in your heart and you believe it, it will come about. It may not be overnight, but it will come. Amen? It will come. <laughs> now, um, oh, safe goals. <laughs> we need to believe God for, for goals that are greater than, than just what we think that we could handle. God gave us imaginations. He gave us the ability to see things. See, with God's creative power, that's how he created the heavens and the earth. It all started in God's imagination. It all started, it, it all formulated, it was a thought by him. Then he spoke it. Then it came about. And that same principle, uh, under that same principle there, that same uh, connection of faith, he's called us to walk in that God kind of faith where we grab a hold of something in our hearts and we see it through. That's what faith is. It's God's creative power. When was the last time? See, we as, we as adults have, have uh, trained our imaginations not to work. You know, we don't use our imagination. We shy away from it. The only thing, it's a shame that the only thing that we use our imaginations for is for worry. Most, most adults. The only thing that we, we truly visualize, look into the future and focus on and visualize, imagine what's going to happen is bad things, worry, fear, doubt. And that's not what God intended it to be. That's not the way that he intended it to be. When was the last time that you closed your eyes and you focused and you imagined the, the, the revival flood of God going through the streets of your city, Amen. Going out to the nations. When was the last time you started believing God for some of these things that he's called you? He's given you this power and this ability to do. Mark eleven twenty. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. Mark eleven twenty three. 23. That's the fulcrum of this. But Jesus told a parable. The parable of the sower. How many of you know that? The parable of the sower. When he told that parable, parable, there's a preface that he gave to it. He says, listen, and he was explaining it to his disciples, the parable of the sower. He says, look, this parable is the most basic of all parables. If you don't catch this parable, if you don't understand, if you don't comprehend it, how are you going to get any parable? Okay? I'm telling you spiritual things here. And if you're not able to grasp just this spiritual truth, this is the most basic thing. Catch it. Don't let it go by. Because if, if you can't, how are you going to understand any of these things that I'm telling you, these parables? He tells the parable of the sower that went out scattering seeds. And what is he scattering seeds on? The soil. What does the soil represent? Hmm? Your believer. Right? Your, your heart. The core part of you. And who has responsibility over that? You do. See, God made us I love how Paul was talking about gardening, and he's, he's really into his garden. In Genesis, when, when God put man into the garden, that was the first task he gave him was to be a gardener, to cultivate. We're talking God's original intention for man. You see, the things in, in life, there was nothing that was meant to be wild. 
even before the fall, even before sin, there's, you know, a bush, a forest, things growing in the wild, uncultivated, ungardened. That wasn't meant to be. God called us to be cultivators, to be gardens. And this is the most basic truth that he told here, the parable of the sower, is you've got to mind your heart. You've got to, wa- you've got to get in there and get those stones out. You've got to weed out those, those thorns that are choking, the, the worry, the doubt, the fear, the deception. Keep your garden cultivated. Break up that fallow ground. Get that rototiller out and get, make sure there's no hard paths where the seeds, seeds can't penetrate. Make sure that your heart is a fertile place. Guard your heart above all things, for out of it flows the issues of life. Out of it flows the seed. That's where the seeds are going to grow up and produce fruit. That's where the life comes from, is your heart, because that's where you believe That's the deepest core part of you. That's where all faith takes place, is in your emotions, in your heart. Mark 11, 23. You guys go to this church. You should have this verse memorized by now. I tell you, you shouldn't even have to turn there. Come on. Mark 11, 23. Let's dissect it here. And Jesus answering, I'm going to start at 22, okay? Jesus answering said unto them, have faith in God, or as we know that it says, have the God kind of faith. Basically, that's what the the Greek uh, terminology there is. Jesus is basically saying, have the God kind of faith. For verily I say unto you, which is basically a Greek exclamation point, the equivalent. I mean, in, in Greek, they didn't have... Uh, punctuation. They didn't have periods, exclamation points. Things. This is the equivalent to a Greek exclamation point. Verily I say unto you, get a hold of this. I'm letting you in on a secret here. That whosoever, whosoever, not just Christians, not just people who, this, this is a law. By the way, do you know this is a law that works for both good and bad? What, what, is it that I, what is it that we've been talking about here? Everything in your life, all right? Good or bad. Jesus just got done cursing a fig tree. How spiritual is that? To, to illustrate this, okay? <laughs> Blessing or curse. Good or bad. Accept it or not accept it. This is a law. Gravity, I mean, gravity works for anybody, all right? Whether you're Adolf Hitler or Mother Teresa, if you... You jump, you're coming down. Gravity works, it's a law, okay? Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, in his heart, in his believer, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Very interesting to see there. I'm sure this has been pointed out many times, but notice that the word believe is used only once, and the word say is used three times. You need to watch what you say. It's a direct reflection of what's in your heart. Amen? That's how you get from the, the upper level down to that inner believer, okay? Now, some people... Um, I'm going to plagiarize Pastor Paul here a little bit on this. Some people think, I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to try confessing the word of God to change the situations in my life. And they, they go about and they do it and they give up. And you go, well, what happened there? Well, three or four days I tried it. And it must have been at least a half a dozen times that I confessed the word of God rather than the circumstances. I mean, so you got to see how intense my faith was. Listen, it's not going to... you got to stick with it here, okay? It's not going to transform overnight like that, all right? It's not going to... A whole lifetime of doubt... And negativity is not going to be overturned 
in a couple of days, all right? A whole field full of weeds is not going to turn around by sprinkling a few good seeds and walking away, all right? It takes time. It takes time. Now, Kenneth, Kenneth Copeland, uh, I love this illustration. This is great. Listen to this now. Kenneth Copeland says, <clears throat> uh, back during World War II, the Germans, the, the British wanted to infiltrate the German ranks and send spies into there. And they knew that they couldn't use uh, people who, you know, in order to become a spy, you can't just have, you know, speak German. It's got to be fluent and no detectable accent, okay? You have to be German. And, uh, you know, the, so the people that already spoke German, it's like, well, I don't know if we could trust them. They might be spies themselves from the other place. So they were like, we, we're going to do this program where we take a British person, born and raised, we know we could trust them, and we're going to teach them how to speak German completely fluently, no detectable accent. How long is it going to take for us to do that? We got to get going on this now. How long is it going to take? Can you, anybody imagine how long it would be for them to do that? And some people might think, boy, that would take years. It would take a long time to do that. To go from zero to no detectable accent, how long would that take? You know what they found? It's pretty interesting. They found that it took six weeks. It took only six weeks to get from zero to complete fluent German. No detectable accent. But you know what they also found? The, the, the contingency is this. It had to be a thing called total immersion. Complete, total immersion. Day, night, eat, sleep, drink, German. Nothing more. You had to be completely immersed in it. Okay? Now, one thing that's interesting about that, I love, I love it when you start to study science. And this is something that, that the field of psychology may have even used this study to figure out how long could it take to completely learn a, a new culture. And you realize that six weeks, uh, this is some good scientific finding, right? Six weeks. And how many days are in a week? Seven. So six times seven is 42 days. 42 days to completely learn a new culture. Now, think about this. 42 days is basically like 40 days and 40 nights, right? I mean, give or take a little bit, but it's basic. 40 days and 40 nights, that's basically what six weeks is. Is there any biblical significance to 40 days and 40 nights? There was, it was 40 days and 40 nights Noah was on the ark. 40 days and 40 nights that Moses was up on the mountain receiving the, the law. 40 days and 40 nights Jesus fasted in the wilderness. 40 days and 40 nights between when, when Jesus' ascension and the day of Pentecost. It's a number of transformation. It's a number of complete renewing of the mind. Everybody say, total immersion. Write that down, okay? Total immersion. Because you see, we get discouraged if it doesn't happen overnight. We walk away from a, a bit, we're all motivated, and yes, transformed by the renewing of my mind. I'm going to praise God, Jesus is Lord of my life, and I'm going to walk in faith. Hallelujah. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be like Jesus' disciples, oh, ye of little faith. I'm going to have a... a Faith that moves a mountain. And if you want your heart to be transformed, I'm telling you this right now, it's a process. And it's going to take some time. And don't get discouraged if it doesn't happen overnight. Okay? Because it's got to get from here down to here. It's got to be a complete transformation of the ingrained part of you, your believer. Okay? So when we talk about believing in your heart, realize that it's a, it's a process. It's going to take some effort on your part. You're going to have to get your gardening gloves on, get, get, get in there, get those stones out, pull those weeds. I have, uh, in my car, I have CDs of, um, of Scripture, just New Testament Scriptures being written. So everywhere I'm driving to work and I'm hearing, you know, 
It's, it's uh, the voice. There's like some soft music in the background. These guys reading the scripture. And uh, then, you know, I go and pick up my kids. They're like, Dad, turn it off. Come on. I'm, I'm like, hey, I just, I want this stuff on the inside of me. I want to be immersed in it. That's why we read. That's why you got to get alone and you got to pray. That's why you got to, that's why it, it's a discipline. It's going to take some time. And you know what? You know what the great thing is? Your flesh is fickle. <laughs> Your flesh, um, it might not want to at first, but you show it who's boss, it'll come around. Pretty soon, pretty soon you'll find yourself, your flesh saying, hey, let's go read the Bible. <laughs> you know, you're, 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 you form a habit out of it. That's what successful people will tell you. Habits. It's not successful things that you do one time. It's successful habits day in and day out. Okay? So I just, I just love it when people study out a matter, search out a matter even at, to a scientific degree, and they find that stuff that they find was in here all along. You know? God is sitting there saying, I could have told you. You know? Could have told you that. Get into the word here. One thing I want to bring out here. This is about this law, Mark eleven twenty three. 23, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea, that this law that works on anyone, this is a great, tremendous power, amen? I want to read it. I want to read Mark eleven twenty three. 23, by the way. This is the, the, uh, the NRV, the New Roberts version, shall we call it that? This is my own... Uh, version of Mark 11, 23. It says, have the God kind of faith, starting at 22. Moreover, furthermore, in fact, I can't emphasize enough, whatever it is, if there is anything that you want, that you desire, that you are fixated on, then ask for it, pray it, express orally before God, that you want it, and at that moment, close your eyes, believe, believe that it is already yours, envision yourself having obtained it already, embrace the feelings and the emotions associated with already having it. This works, whether it works whether good or bad, okay? A seed, a seed will grow whether it's a good seed or bad, okay? This is a law. Now, There's just a few things I want to say before moving on here, okay? Some people automatically, um, they realize this law, and there's there's maybe even some uh, people that we don't necessarily want to associate with as Christians, uh, New Age, whatever, that get into meditating, and they've discovered this law and stuff. And... um, and, and, you know, go figure. You find something that, that, uh, that's in the Bible. It's a truth that's been in there all along, and it works. Whoa, amazing. Something written by the God of the universe, and it works. And, uh, and so people, you know, whether it's self-help gurus or, or you know, uh, meditation, weird things, you know, they, they've gotten a hold of this and find that it works. And a lot of times they, they regress towards, uh, you know, money or something like that. Well, it's just about getting more money. And uh, so much more to this. First off, I want to say this. This is a truth. And just because somebody grabbed a hold of it that we don't necessarily want to associate with, all right, doesn't make it any less of a truth. We need to not shy away from it. But keep the truth pure and unadulterated because this is a power that that you need to get a hold of and not shy away from this. Okay, look at what Jesus said here in uh, in the following verse, verse 24. After Jesus said this great law, he says, therefore, look at that word, therefore, therefore, because Jesus wants you to be sure of this. I'm telling you about this power, but therefore, I'm telling you, there's, a, there's also a right way to use this. Therefore, whatsoever, therefore, okay, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, 
and you shall have them. Okay? He brings it back to prayer. We've got to keep ourselves hooked up to God. We've got to keep ourselves, um, you know, it's like Dana said this morning. Sometimes the things that we pray for and we think that we want, we don't really want them. We've got to get ourselves hooked up at a place where our deepest believer says, God, I want what your heart is. What the deepest part of us is saying, God, whatever it is that you want, that's what I want. That's what I'm praying for. That's what my faith is out there for. Not just money. That's a whole nother sermon, money. <laughs> you you want to know a secret about money? Just let me say this real quick. You want to know a secret for getting more money, for being financially blessed? Do the opposite of loving money. The love of money is the root of all evil. Do the opposite of loving money, and you will find yourself being blessed financially. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Give. Bibles, this is, this is something that's a law too. Do you know that? Give and it shall be given unto you. Solomon said, there's one who scatters and yet has all the more. There's one who, who withholds what's just rightly due, and it results in only one. There's a, prince, there's a law of giving. And I'm telling you this. Write it down. You want to see financial success? Do the opposite of love, loving money. Okay? Whatever it is, ask yourself, what is it to love money? Do the opposite. Okay? That word love, the love of money is the root of all evil. By the way, that word that they use for love, we know that there's a lot of different words. You know, is it agape love? Is it a... Is it, uh, you know, phileo, what type of love is it? It's actually, the word that they use for love there is a very greedy, self-gaining type of love, okay? Get, get rid of the greed and the, you know, serving mammon. You can't serve both God and mammon. It's absolutely, can we move past the place where we wonder if it's God's will for good things to happen to us? It is, all right? But part of good things happening to us is us having our, right, our hearts, our believers in the right place regarding my, hey, we don't, who needs money? I got 11, Mark eleven twenty three. 23. Come on. I've got, there's, there's big goals that are out there that God's going to bring about in my life, and it's all him. Amen? That's good stuff. That is good stuff. Hallelujah. One thing I want to do just to, to wrap this up here. We're talking about laws. Everything in the universe consists of laws. Everything in the universe. There's many different laws. And, and you see, the Bible is, is a book that's full of explaining spiritual laws. Law, you know, things that we wouldn't know otherwise. It just comes in... I mean, we, don't, we, don't, we weren't born with a, a sense to see into the, into the spiritual. You know what I mean? We don't have that sixth sense, so to speak. And it's like, I mean, think about how, how you would describe a beautiful sunset to somebody born blind. All right? It would be a little difficult. You'd probably, um, you know, explain the concept of what it looks like. It's round and it's up in the sky. You know, that'd probably be easy, but... Explain how beautiful it is and, and the feelings of so. Imagine yourself trying to do that to somebody born blind. You would probably use a lot of metaphors and things like that. Well, to describe beauty, you're going to describe, you know, using the other four senses that they do have, like sound or, you know, the most beautiful music that you ever heard or touch. Think about a soft, satiny pillow or something, you know. That's. In a lot of ways, that's, that's what the Bible is. That's why there's so many parables in it. Trying to define something that's spiritual in the terms that we can understand it. And so there's many truths that the Bible brings out. There's spiritual truths that we wouldn't be able to necessarily get a hold, get the best handle on. I mean, we, they're, they're laws and they're true. But we wouldn't necessarily have the best handle on them unless we were able to uh, 
uh, just like, you know, just like a, somebody born blind could feel the heat from the sun, it, there's, it, it's certainly a truth and reality. There's laws, but they're not fully able to experience it unless you have somebody there to explain things to them and to show them. And God is revealing those things to us, to our spirits, letting us know the laws of the, of the universe. See, laws can both help or hinder you. They don't care who you are. They work always. They do not cease. They are simply overridden by other laws. <clears throat> Take, for instance, um, gravity. And I know, Paul, again, you've used this illustration before, but uh, let me ask you this. Could David or Moses or those guys, could they have flown back in their day? Absolutely, they could have flown. They didn't have airplanes back then, though. They, they, didn't, they didn't understand. Nobody had invented something that could break, that could override the law of gravity at that time, which, is, which we know as flight. And it wasn't until the Wright brothers came along and found that no matter how big that, you know, you can make a 747 that weighs 600,000 pounds, once you get it to 160 miles per an hour on that runway, though, it will lift up. And the laws of thrust and lift will override the law of gravity. Now, did the law of gravity cease once flight was invented? No, no, these, these laws all work together. They're necessary for one another. But one law, you see, one thing that Jesus said to his disciples, he says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That word keys, it basically means laws. I'm going to teach you the secrets to the laws, to the kingdom of heaven. You're going to know how to bring things from the spiritual realm into the physical realm. You're going to know what the things that you do are going to have an in impact and most things start in the, in the spiritual realm. Amen? They start in the, in the spiritual realm. The battle is in the spirit. We war not after the, the flesh, but it's after the spirit. In Romans 8, verse 2, there's two laws talked about here. Just like we have uh, the law of gravity and the law of flying overriding that law. There's a great law mentioned here in Romans 8, 2. It's the law of sin and death. And it is because of the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is what condemns us all. It brings us all, on, I mean, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's a law. It applies to us all. There's none righteous, not even one. We all fall short of that. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. It's overridden it. It's a greater law. Have you found that law in your life? Have you opened up your life to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus where there's no more condemnation for you? Amen. Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. To partner with this ministry or for any additional information, please visit libertychristiancenter.com org.